Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content and wish to see it continue, become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. We start once again with a word of thanks for our supporters, uh, especially James B., Brian M., Kathy R., and Les R. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you sincerely. We're about 27% of the way to the amount of support we need to make this podcast a sustainable thing. Actually, 29%. Oh, we're, yeah, we had a couple, re- the memo. couple of recent supporters, so all the way up to 29%. Fantastic. But we really need to get to 35% of what of our total goal by the end of December. So if you can help us. So there you go. There's your task. <laughs> so, if, so if you've enjoyed these episodes, if you've learned something, if you've been inspired or edified or helped in your faith, please consider becoming a supporter. You can learn about our support tiers at American Catholic History dot org slash support the lowest tier is just five dollars a month at the cost of a fancy peppermint starbucks or duncan as we prefer yes. coffee so you know just yeah. I, but I will say the fifteen dollar level has seemed to be a little more popular lately. That gets you a mug and a really nice sticker. So, yeah, fifteen dollars. You know, that's 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 reachable too. Three of those coffees per month. Anyway, so that said, and thank you for your support. Let's get on with the show. Okay, today we're talking at long last about Bishop Benedict Joseph Flage. We've mentioned him a lot. Um, we're really excited to tell you his story today. He's the first bishop of Bardstown and later the first bishop of Louisville when the sea moved 40 miles north-northwest. Flaget is the reason we have an incredible pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon country. We're going back in August of next year, and we hope you'll join us. Make it a Christmas present for yourself and your loved ones. This is is a very holy, holy place. It's just so filled with great Catholic history. And there's also bourbon. (laughs) Yes, there are bourbon tastings and bourbon tours. But the churches and just being in that place where so much amazing history happened is a really wonderful experience. I've talked before about praying at the tombs of the first Trappists and the first Dominicans to come to the United States. And it's just such a powerful experience. Hopefully this episode will help you make the choice to come with us. Get details at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash pilgrimages. And my favorite moment was praying at Bishop Flaget's tomb. Mm -hmm. Frankly, uh, to me, Benedict Joseph Flaget should be a canonized saint. And I mean that in all sincerity. And the fact that he isn't, frankly, is further proof of that he should be, if if that makes any sense. Um, Well, what you're talking about is his incredible humility. Yeah, that and of course, the miracles credited to his prayers while he was still alive. But honestly, with his humility, it may well be his own entreaties at the throne of God asking not to be canonized because he doesn't feel he deserves the honor that has forestalled the process. Um, okay. <laughs> not sure it works that way, but okay. I think I kind of get your point. <laughs> <laughs> but what is undeniable is his incredible faith in God and his work ethic. He was the first bishop of a diocese that, when it was established in 1808, covered roughly half the territory of the United States. It had the current United States, not now, (laughs) just to clarify. It had all our portions of present-day Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Arkansas, Minnesota, and Missouri. By the time he died, his diocese was just the state of Kentucky. Yes, and by that time, the dioceses of Cincinnati, St. Louis, Nashville, Detroit, Vincennes, Chicago, and Milwaukee had been erected out of land previously covered by Bardstown and Bishop Flaget. But his influence wasn't just in that vast territory west of the Appalachians. He was a trusted advisor on church matters in the major cities of the East Coast, as well as in Rome. In short, it is not a stretch to say that he was the most influential and important bishop of the very early days of the church in the U.S., who wasn't named John Carroll. Yeah, in that generation before Francis Kenrick and John Hughes, Flaget stands out even over Jean Chevreux, first bishop of Boston. Chevreux was wildly important for Catholicism in the Northeast, and John Carroll respected him greatly. 
but he departed Boston in 1823 after just 15 years and spent the rest of his life back in his native France. And since the first few bishops of New York and Philadelphia were either absent, short-lived, or ineffective, Flaget was massively important for the development of the church in the U.S. It helps that he was a personally a very holy and wise man with an iron constitution. <laughs> so let's tell his story from the beginning. Yeah. So Benedict Joseph Flaget was born in Auvergne, France in November 7th, 1763. His father died shortly before he was born and his mother died when he was just two years old. He and his two brothers were raised by an aunt, their mother's sister. She was a wonderful, pious woman and later in Bishop Flaget's uh, life, he gushed about how much he owed her and how ready he was to spare any expense to make her life comfortable. Helping the aunt to raise them was their father's brother, who was a canon at the nearby collegiate church. At 17, Flaget entered the Sulpician Seminary, and he joined the Sulpicians there three years later after being very moved by their way of life and their charism for missionary work and teaching priests. Ordained in 1787, he taught at the Sulpician seminaries in France, two of them, until the bloody French Revolution changed his life. <laughs> that bloody French Revolution again. It's like the know-nothings. They just keep coming up as a cause of events in American Catholic history. Yeah, it was one of the most insane episodes in human history. Flaget was forced to leave his post at the seminary in 1791, and with the advice of his Sulpician superior, he fled France for America. He sailed from Bordeaux in January 1792. On the ship, which took him across the ocean, were a couple of other Sulpician priests, including Jean-Baptiste Marie David. David would eventually be his coadjutor in Bardstown and eventually his successor, then his predecessor in that sea. More on that crazy happening in a moment. Among the others on that ship was a seminarian who was nearly done with his studies, one Stephen Baden. Baden, of course, would become the first man ordained in the United States and then would be stationed as a missionary in Kentucky. In fact, not just a missionary, but the missionary in Kentucky before Bishop Flaget showed up. He was a hardworking, devoted missionary and he was cantankerous. We told his colorful story in a previous episode. Flaget and company reported to Baltimore at the end of March 1792, where they were received warmly by John Carroll, Bishop of Baltimore. At the time, of course, Baltimore was the only diocese in the country, so Carroll was very happy to get more priests, especially educated and capable ones. And Flaget fit that bill nicely. After just two months in America, Father Flaget was sent to one of the oldest Catholic cities west of the Appalachians, the post of Vincennes on the banks of the Wabash River in southwestern Indiana. Vincennes had been a very important military post, first built by the French, then the British controlled it, and then the Americans took it during the Revolution with the help of French Catholics in the area and their priest, Father Pierre Jabot. That's another interesting story that we told in a previous episode. So he set off for Vincennes, stopping for a time at Pittsburgh, where he was received by General Anthony Wayne. From there, he set off on flat boat down the Ohio River until coming to the Falls of the Ohio. Which is where the town of Louisville sprang up. Yes, indeed. So his first time in Kentucky was long before he had any inkling that that state and the city where he disembarked would become his life's work. At Vincennes, he found the faith in a pitiable state. The chapel was dilapidated. The practice of the faith was shoddy. They hadn't had a priest in at least five years, and it was only a traveling priest who came by occasionally. He poured himself into the work, fixing up the chapel, hearing confessions, preparing for confirmations, providing catechesis, and generally bolstering the faith of the people through his personal piety and hard work. He also established a school and a library at Vincennes, making those the oldest educational institutions in Indiana. His work paid off. In his two short years at Vincennes, he greatly improved their situation. So when he was recalled to Baltimore, the people were restored and the faith thriving. Boarding a boat in 1794, he sailed the rest of the way down the Ohio, then south on the Mississippi to New Orleans, where he boarded a ship to return to Baltimore because that route really did make more sense than trekking back across country over the Appalachians to get back to Baltimore. Yeah. He spent the next few years teaching at Georgetown, where one of his students was the future Bishop of Boston, Benedict Joseph Fenwick. In 1798, he was sent to Cuba to establish missionary work there. He returned to Baltimore in 1801, where he taught again. 
But then the real work of his life was to begin a few years later. In 1808, Bishop Carroll prevailed upon Rome to erect four new dioceses in the United States. Three of them were obvious, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. The fourth had to be a city out west to manage everything west of that natural barrier, the Appalachian Mountains. The most prominent city of Catholics at the time was tiny Bardstown, Kentucky, for the reason why you should listen to our episode on Kentucky Catholics and bourbon. So Bardstown it was, and that meant that the priest most suited to give a recommendation for who the new bishop would be was Stephen Baden, and he recommended his old friend from France, Father Benedict Joseph Flaget. Flaget was actually in Emmitsburg, Maryland, when he got the news. Another refugee from the French Revolution, Sulpician Father John Dubois, had recently founded Mount St. Mary's there. Dubois is another incredible figure from early American Catholicism whom hardly anyone knows about. We told his story also. Well, Flaget was so shocked that he traveled immediately to Baltimore to ask Father David if there hadn't been some mistake. Father Flaget thought that Father David would be a much better fit for the position. Father David, it turned out, had feared that Rome would name him and was relieved when he heard it was Flaget. But Father David agreed on the spot to go with him to Bardstown if he could not escape the duty. Flaget determined to try one last thing. He hoped his superior in the Sulpician order, the one who had encouraged him to go be a missionary in America, would help him get out of it. But when they met in France, the Sulpician superior's first words to him were, My lord, you should have been already in your diocese. And with that, Father Flaget knew he would have to accept. So he returned to America, bringing with him two more very auspicious Sulpicians, Father Simon Gabriel Brute, who would be the first bishop of Vincennes when it became a diocese, and Father Guy Chabrat, who would be Flaget's second coadjutor bishop in Bardstown. So he returned to the U.S. where he was consecrated bishop of Bardstown by now Archbishop John Carroll on November 4th, 1810. The sermon at his consecration was preached by Jean Chevreux, the recently consecrated first bishop of Boston. Plaget, with loyal friend Father David at his side, was set to depart for Bardstown. But since he had no money, he was unable to set off until May 11, 1811. So even though Bardstown was a diocese since 1808, its first bishop didn't arrive until 1811. When he finally did arrive, he had no cathedral, no home, and no obvious means of support. But he had absolute faith that God would provide. In reflecting on entering Bardstown for that first time, he wrote, In entering the town, I devoted myself to all the guardian angels who reside therein, and I prayed to God with all my heart to make me die a thousand times should I not become an instrument of his glory in this new diocese. O oh, my dear brother, have compassion on me, overloaded with so heavy a burden, and pray fervently to God that he would vouchsafe to lighten it. Yeah, he had very much a Lord, not as I will, but as thou wilt attitude. And he needed it because it was the Lord's work above all. At first, he lived and worked out of St. Stephen, which was the farm and home built by Father Stephen Baden. Also in residence at St. Stephen was the other great missionary priest of the region, the stout Belgian Father Charles Nerinx. Bishop Flaget also welcomed the seminarians who had traveled with him to live at St. Stephen. From these very humble beginnings, he once again poured himself into the work. From St. Stephen's, they moved the diocesan base of operations to a new church on land donated by the Howard family. St. Thomas Church was built in 1813, with the log cabin nearby soon becoming the first seminary and chancery west of the Appalachians. Again, St. Thomas is on our itinerary for the pilgrimage, and the cabin is still there. It's restored and is a museum now, and just really fascinating to, to tour. One of the artifacts that I love seeing when we were there was... Flaget's host maker. I really think about how did they get hosts back then in the, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the country um, where, you know, we don't really think about that, where they come from. But in that situation, the priests and more likely the seminarians had to make them one at a time with this little waffle iron looking thing. It's such a cool item to see. And it really contextualizes the practice and work of the faith. Yeah, it really is a neat thing to see. And also during this time, Bishop Flaget ordained Guy Chabrat, the first ordination west of the Appalachians in 1812. Bishop Flaget began to travel around his vast diocese. He made multiple long 
long trips during his first few years. At one point, he wrote that he hadn't spent more than four nights under one roof at any time during his first few years as Bishop of Bardstown. He lived in his saddle. He would travel many miles in a day, and sometimes that meant not eating for most of the day because he was scheduled to offer mass at the place he was headed. But he endured it all with joy and zeal for the work. After he'd visited towns and chapels in Kentucky and Tennessee, he headed north. He found Catholics in parts of Ohio and eventually asked the superior of the Dominicans at St. Rose Priory in Kentucky, Edward Fenwick, to make regular missionary trips through that state. He visited the Great Lakes region, eventually sending priests to minister among the native tribes in that region. In Detroit, Flaget was reunited with Father Gabriel Richard, who, as we said, had been the Sulpician superior at the seminary where Flaget was ordained. And yes, we told Rich Richard's and Fenwick's stories in previous episodes also. And then he went back to Indiana, where he once again visited Vincennes. The people were overjoyed to see him again, as it had been nearly 20 years since he was last there. In the midst of these travels, he returned to Baltimore for meetings with Bishop Carroll and others, and quite a change had come over him. The last time he was in Baltimore, he had just been consecrated and was apprehensive about going to take on his new duties. This time, just a few years later, he lamented that bad weather would prevent him from returning to Bardstown. He wrote in his journal, an olive tree transplanted to Lapland would not be more out of place than I am at Baltimore where I am detained by snow and bad roads. That's quite a change, and it is beautiful. He returned to Bardstown in 1813 and resumed his apostolic missionary visits. After the death of Bishop Carroll in 1816, Bishop Flaget became more or less the elder statesman of the American church. He paved the way for St. Louis to become a diocese, recommended that Cincinnati become a diocese, and that Father Edward Fenwick of the Dominicans become the first bishop. And that appointment made sense since Fenwick had been the major missionary to Ohio for years. Interestingly, the other candidate for Cincinnati was Prince Galitzin, the longtime missionary to Central and Western Pennsylvania. But Galitzin made clear he was not interested well before his name was formally submitted, so Fenwick was the only other sensible choice. And we told Galitzin's story also in a previous episode. <laughs> As we mentioned before... Bishop Flaget's name has come up a lot over the years we've been doing this podcast, though we've never fleshed out his story like we are now. Yeah. And this is this this is the thing about Flaget. Because of his French roots, the French Revolution, his personal holiness, his longevity, and his stability, he was so much in the middle of so much that was going on in the church in America. He was influential in Jean Dubois, becoming the third bishop of New York. Benedict Fenwick, not Edward, but Benedict, Benedict becoming the second bishop of Boston. Simon Brute, the first bishop of Vincennes, and so many others. When Archbishop Marshall of Baltimore died, Bishop Flaget was called upon to consecrate his successor, James Whitfield, as the fourth archbishop in that premier see. And in 1830, Bishop Flaget's personal secretary, Francis Kenrick, was named the fourth bishop of Philadelphia. Like we said, he may well have been the second most important bishop in the early years of the church in America, even though he was a missionary bishop in the largest, most dispersed, and least wealthy diocese. But as time went on in his years of traveling on foot and on horseback took their toll on his body, he began to hope and pray for a coadjutor bishop, someone who would be able to cover for him when he was out of town and who would be set to take over for him when he finally, mercifully, was permitted to resign. Well, he got that coadjutor in 1819, when his loyal friend Father David was named his coadjutor, so he could travel with the confidence that matters of the diocese were being handled properly back at home. As the 1820s gave way to the 1830s, he began to wish for that day when he could resign, or perhaps even die, to be relieved of the duties. In 1832, his health had deteriorated so much that he officially offered his resignation to Rome. That same year, a cholera epidemic broke out in the burgeoning city of Louisville. Bishop Flaget hurried to that city to minister to the dying. It's almost like he wasn't waiting around to see if Rome would relieve him of the burden. Maybe death would come and do it sooner, you know? Of course, concern for souls is what impelled him to work among the sick and dying in Louisville, but he may well have seen death as a good side effect. Yeah, maybe. When that epidemic had burned out and he didn't die, he continued on to St. Louis to visit with his good friend Bishop Rosati. It was while there he received word from his coadjutor, Bishop David, that his resignation had actually been accepted, and David was now the Bishop of Bardstown. 
However, in the same message, Bishop David informed Flaget that the people and clergy of Bargetown were incensed. They refused to believe it. They didn't want Bishop David. They wanted Bishop Flaget. So he returned to Bargetown to try to calm the situation, but it didn't work. Eventually, Bishop David submitted his resignation to Rome. They accepted it and reinstated Bishop Flaget as the ordinary of Bargetown. And thus, he was compelled to carry on the burden. And that's how Bishop David was his successor and predecessor. Yeah. Yeah. And now, mind you, it wasn't that Bishop Flaget shirked his duties or didn't love his people, but he desired solitude and peace. He preferred to be a solitary missionary working in a particular field, not the oft-consulted leader of the church who bore responsibility for so many souls, and not just those in his own diocese, but those in dioceses where he was instrumental in selecting their bishop. But his humility and devotion to duty ruled the day. But now he needed another coadjutor. David had remained in Bardstown to continue to teach, eventually dying in 1841, but he could no longer be coadjutor. So Flaget requested a new one and prayed that it would not be long. In 1834, his prayer was answered again. This time, it was his other loyal friend from France, Guy Chabrat. With Chabrat in place, he was finally able to take the trip back to Europe that he had so desired. He spent four years in Europe visiting family, friends, the Pope, nearly every diocese in France, and even dining with royalty who wished to learn of his missionary work. In his conversation with the Pope, Gregory the Sixteenth, at this point, he brought up the idea of moving the seat of his diocese from Bargetown to the now much larger city of Louisville. That city had grown dramatically, and much of the growth was Catholic immigrants. No decision was made immediately, but the Pope sent the matter to the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. He returned from Europe with many items for his cathedral in Bardstown, the monumental cathedral of St. Joseph, which he had built in 1820. Paintings, statues, and the tabernacle, which is still there, are gifts from the Pope and a number of kings, princes, and dukes. We saw them on our first trip, and we'll see them again next August. And shortly after returning in 1839, he received word that the Pope had approved his decision to move the seat to Louisville. That decision went into effect in 1841. Flaget was sad to leave Bargetown after calling the city home for 30 years. Granted, much of that time he was away from home, but still, it was where he could rest with his beloved seminarians and the families whom he had gotten to know. It was also the center point for the many religious communities and schools he had established or fostered. But the church needed to have its main presence in the largest and most important city in the state. So off to Louisville they went. After this point, Flaget left much of the administration of the diocese to Bishop Chabrat. But his trials were not quite over. Bishop Chabrat began to experience health problems. His eyesight began to fail, and he was forced to travel to France to seek remedy. None was immediate and he was forced to resign his position as coadjutor in 1847. Flaget had outlasted a second coadjutor bishop. Fortunately, this time, Rome didn't waste time naming a third coadjutor. This time, he was a native son of the land, Martin John Spalding. Bishop Flaget's final major acts were to consecrate Spalding and to lay the cornerstone of the new cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville. Spalding, it should be noted, would spend 14 years as Archbishop of Louisville, and then in 1864, he would become the seventh Archbishop of Baltimore. And the man he replaced in Baltimore? Francis Kenrick one Flaget protege succeeding another in America's premier see. And another note is an anecdote we told in the episode about Father Baden. Father Baden, who by this point was himself an old and fading man, was living at the same residence near the cathedral as Bishop Flaget. Father Baden so disapproved of the plan to build a new cathedral that immediately after the laying of the cornerstone, he donned a surplus and stole and processed around the new cathedral location, chanting the miserere and sprinkling holy water in reparation to God for what he viewed as a terrible decision. At this point, Bishop Flaget had had enough. The very next day, he sent Father Baden packing, sending him to live out his days in the company of Bishop Purcell in Cincinnati. <laughs> I'm sorry, that episode makes me laugh every time I, I know, hear it. I know, seriously. <laughs> he, was a, he was quite a character. Yes. 
Bishop Flaget died on February 11th, 1850. He was 86 years old. He was given a vast diocese with hardly any priests and no structure and lived to see it flourish. After his solemn requiem mass, he was buried in the undercroft of the still under construction Cathedral of the Assumption. His humble brick tomb is among the most moving and powerful places I have yet visited. How his cause for canonization has never been opened is a complete mystery to us. His life was of utter service and self-denial in pursuit of souls. If, if his life isn't, isn't a life lived according to take up your cross and come after me, then I don't know what is. Well, one of the things we always say about this podcast is that part of our purpose is to let people know about these uh, yeah, amazing perhaps get some holy of these, people. Get some of these neglected causes open. Yeah. So, you know, if you're inspired by the story, start praying to Bishop Flaget. Yes. What Bishop Flaget built in Bargetown and Louisville is a land of strong faith with multiple institutions, lively and beautiful parishes, religious communities that have changed the church in this country, colleges and schools, orphanages, healthcare institutions, and more. He identified, encouraged, trained, and raised up so many of the great leaders of the church in this country. He entered a missionary field that was fertile, and he helped it grow. Few have had such a large and such a positive impact on the church in America as the humble, hardworking Benedict Joseph Flaget. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters, including exclusive content, books, mugs, and personal conversations. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, find information about our pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. Sign up for our newsletter and find other episodes you might be interested in. As we've mentioned, we really appreciate your support. And that support also can come in the form of giving us ratings and reviews wherever you get your podcast. Those help others find out about our podcast. So please share by word of mouth and also go and give us a rating and review. We also love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. We read all of those emails, even if we're sometimes slow to respond, we have lots of other work we're doing as well. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH Podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. Music